Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, January 16, 2020, and this is the week in charts. A little housekeeping. I haven't decided whether I'm going to do a show next week or not. I find when there's a holiday, it's really hard to get a show together because I guess we're missing, what, uh, 20% of the days? But we'll see. Just keep an eye out on the website. I did add a calendar to the homepage, and I need to do a better job promoting things. I realize that. I've just been so busy, and I, I spend a lot of time and, and hopefully you can tell working on these slides and all it just kind of eats up a lot of time and never get around to promoting it and all so anyway i'm going to work harder on that i promise obviously i want to thank all you guys and girls for being here i appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule i am humbled by your presence uh that date is wrong obviously it's the 16th of january 2020. i'm going to follow up on my ongoing quest and I think if I succeed or even come anywhere near succeeding, I'm going to be doing quite well. And I'll show you that, and that'll make a lot more sense for those who hadn't been following along the last couple of weeks. And I'm going to continue with the trading resolutions for 2020. As I said recently, you're going to see some overlap between these shows. In fact, what happened was I was working on my slides for my uh, stock charts show, and I started to elaborate on some of these uh resolutions and then because that show got canceled i decided well i'm going to carry that those slides back over to to this show so there's going to be a little overlap here and there and some people say it's good to hear things more than once and other people say stop beating the dead horse well i'm going to keep beating a dead horse until you people get it and you know what until i stop doing stupid stuff too how's that a little admission of occasional guilt here and there this is flame screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often sum it up all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, my ongoing quest is to have the short-term trading pay for the long-term trading. So I want to continue to follow up on that, and I'm going to continue to do this for a while to see how it all shakes out and to show you the methodology in action. So last couple of weeks we talked about free rolling which is a term i borrowed from charlie kirk he looked at my money management and was saying hey i like that free rolling aspect meaning that you take half your shares off you bump your stop to break even and then you just you're free rolling you're kind of playing with the market's money and that's a great place to be both from a psychological standpoint and from a monetary standpoint, sometimes you only need a little bit of a trade and you stop out. And if you can do that over and over again, and then occasionally hit the home run, then you're gonna do extremely well. And it, it really warms my heart when I am in the Facebook group and I see you guys talking about taking partial profits and bumping stops and following along at home. And that's really a cool thing. Now, there's one I will show you here in one second, which was a near a miss, as I often preach, and this is provided you have a little bit of experience, but once you have a little experience, then you can start to apply a little bit of discretion. You gotta be careful with discretion. Now, I actually missed a trade by trying to put in a little bit of discretion recently, and that's kind of got me a little bummed out. So there is a downside to discretion. But as a general statement, once you get a little experience, discretion works out pretty well. Donald says it's also called two for one money management. Yeah, I think that's what Larry Connors initially called it. And then I took the ball and ran with it and kind of made it my own. I used to call it grandma money management too. And that's when I was living in Mississippi. I remember when the casinos came to town, all the little old ladies got excited. And they'd bring 20 bucks with them. And then if they were up 20 bucks, they'd pocket that 20 bucks and play with the house's money. It's not a good idea to use these gambling analogies. And I guess free rolling is a gambling analogy too. But for lack of a better analogy, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to position yourself where barring overnight gaps, the worst you could do is break even. And the best you could do would be a home run. And that's what we're playing for, these occasional big home runs like in this current portfolio 100 and something percent move it's something like kod i want to make sure that that i'm also pointing some of these things out that i'm pointing on stock chart shows such as the missed trade of the week 
or the best trade of the week or things along that line. And along those lines, I got to thinking for this week's stock chart show, which I guess will be postponed for next week. I wanted to show some existing trades, but show that following the process is really what's going to get you there. It's, it's, yeah, it's great to have a brand new setup and have it take off and say, hey, look at this setup, look how smart I am. But I think longer term, it's also vitally important to make sure you're really, really following that process. So I thought it would be kind of cool to, and I was just going to show one or two, but I ended up putting the whole portfolio into this presentation. So I want to show what happened over the last week. And I want to make a case for continuing to follow the process, whether it turns out okay or not so okay. So let's take a look at this. So here's a position where we're free rolling. And if we go back about a week or so, I guess Wednesday to Wednesday, you could see that the stock dropped 3.82 points. And there's 143 shares. Now you would actually double that number if you did not take those partial profits going in. So that's 100, 146, 143 shares, excuse me, left on that initial buy because we took profits on half of those. And with a little discretion, we were able to squeeze out a lot more than 1,000 per 100K. And if you go in and look at the presentations that I did after this thing initially blasted all off or took off, I should say, you you would see how we worked that out. And some of you played along at home. What happened with me is kind of more of an accident than anything. After the open, when I felt like, well, the, this profit target had been hit, I went to take profits, the stock was halted. So what I did was I just pulled that order and then I waited to see how it's going to open after the halt. And then I kept trailing the stop higher and two or three times I went to sell and it was halted more than once. And then finally, I think after the third halt, I got stopped out at a much higher level. But anyway, as you can see, this one obviously didn't work out so good. So there's a loss of $546 for the week on that. Now let's take a look at T and K. T and K is another position where we're free rolling. You can see that it's been in a bit of a correction. It lost a dollar forty-five, and if you multiply that by the two hundred fifty, then that's remaining shares. Initially, it was five hundred shares, and this was a reverse split, so it's even more complicated. But the math is pretty easy now. There's two hundred fifty shares left, so that's a three hundred and sixty-two dollar loss on that. So you can see, well, we're not doing so hot so far, right? Take a look at this one, another one that's already hit the initial profit target. So keep in mind, these are open profits that are being given up. Now, let me tell you something right now, an open profit or a loss, however you want to look at it, if you're losing money, it still hurts, even if it's money that you already made and you're giving up some of that. And that never gets easy, but it does get a little easier. And I'm going to touch upon that. I'm getting a little further ahead of myself than I want to here. But anyway, so here's another one down for the week, down $2.80. There's 123 shares left. So obviously, it'd be twice that amount before was cashed out. Now, you do round up or down on these, depending on your account size and, and your level of expertise. I tend to round up a little bit, a little bit, probably too much, if anything, but I do round up on these. So it was a $345 loss there on the position, but it hasn't stopped out. Now, in the next Q&A, one of the interesting things that I noticed, I they had some trading problems that got buried in the database, and I didn't see them until recently. And I noticed that so far, I'm working my way through them. There's about 10 trading problems that we're going to cover on Tuesday. And I noticed that so far, every one of them, I'm probably about five or six in, but every one of them could have been fixed through a little bit of a procedural thing. And I'll give you a quick example. Like one guy says he tends to hold on too long and ends up riding his winners down to zero. Well, that's an easy fix. 
just have a stop in place. I know, easier said than done, but we'll get into that before we digress too much. The point I'm trying to make and the reason the way this kind of dovetails in is that as long as you're not stopped out, especially if you're free rolling, but even if you're not free rolling, just go ahead and let the chips fall where they may. It makes your life a lot easier if you just follow the plan in longer term, you'll do just fine doing that. And again, I'm getting a little further ahead of myself because I do want to talk a little bit about micromanagement in a few minutes. But let's say you're kind of bummed out because this thing's lost three bucks in a week and now you're down three or four hundred dollars in one week. And it's like, you know what, I'm just going to get out. Well, what's going to happen tomorrow if the stock gets bought out and it's 90 something dollars a share? You're going to be pretty depressed about that, especially since you've held it for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, looky here, we actually have one that went up. But wait a minute, Dave, that's a short. So this one went the wrong way last week. So yet another losing trade. Now, one thing I was thinking about before we went live, the reason was I'm looking at my open portfolio and I'm noticing that I'm doing okay for today, but I'm not as good as I was earlier. And that made me think about how observations, especially negative observations, have a negative effect on you or too many observations, I should say. So remember that a negative observation has twice the emotions of a positive observation. So I'm a little frazzled this morning trying to get everything up and running. The, like for instance, I didn't get around to promoting the show and all. I was telling my wife, she just stopped, stopped in from a job. And she's like, what's wrong? It's like, well, I'm actually doing okay in the markets today, but not as good as I was, but I'm still up. You know, and she's, and she's like, well, that's a good thing, right? I'm like, yeah. So it made me cognizant of the fact that these negative observations have a really big impact on you. And even though your overall portfolio is doing pretty good, you start staring at a lot of losses for a week, even if you're up for the week. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself. It can begin to wear on you because what? Every negative observation has twice, and some people say 10 times or more, but I'm going to stick with twice. And I've seen two and a half in some places, but two and a half or two times the emotions. Now, here we have one that actually is going up, and this is one where we're free rolling, and we have 649 shares left. It's up a buck and change. So that's a $662 gain on the week. Here's Ping, which rallied up to hit the initial profit target. So we had 270 shares on, so you take half of those off for the initial profit target based on where we started the week to the initial profit target that's a 324 dollar gain and now we are free rolling on the position so for the week it's another 451 dollars so the point i think i'm trying to make today or i hope i'm trying to make i should say is that following the process not all the time but sometimes can work out nicely, even though there is still a lot of negatives. There will be blood. PGNY for the week gained a dollar sixty-four. But what's interesting is this one came really close to the initial profit target. So for the week, if you're following everything mechanically, which if you're new to trading, I recommend you do. But as you gain a little experience, I would highly recommend you learn how to apply a little bit of discretion. So $410 for the week without discretion, but with a little discretion. And by that, I'm, I'm saying, look, this thing just can't quite get to that initial profit target up around 36. Now, don't don't cash in when you're up a couple hundred bucks on a position where you're trying to get at least a thousand dollars out for that first half. Right. But if you're up 900 bucks or so, or 850 bucks, and it just can't seem to get there, it's okay to take a little profits a little bit early. That's not where we get rich, or that's not how we get rich on that first loaf. That first loaf, the first half of the shares, just keeps us in the game. So I think a reasonable number here, and I did take half of my shares in case you're wondering, off but a reasonable number here i think would be about 35 because it just kept bumping up against that 35 
And I think you had multiple chances to get out in this particular case. Now also keep in mind that I do tell people the night before in the trading service when we're getting close, hey, look, we're on profit target, watch here, do not split hairs. And if I, if you're in the Facebook group, which if you're in the service, you should be, and you could also join the Facebook group if you are a gold member of DaveLanner.com. The group is free, but you have to be a member of DaveLanner.com, a gold member that is. And that keeps the riffraff out. I'm kind of half joking, but if you've ever been around forums, as I said before, you get a lot of noise and fluff in there and you got to, it's a, it's a constant as an editor, I guess, or admin, I should say, it's a lot of work to stay on top of these things. And I think just by qualifying people going in, it's going to really help out. But anyway, the point is that I will put out posts to kind of clue you in to what I'm doing and what I think you should be doing based on the money management and a lot of common sense. Not that I'm the grand Pumbaa or anything, but I've been following a methodology for a long time and I work hard to continue to follow it. And now that I have the Facebook group, I can do that in real time along with you guys. And by the way, that warms my heart when, when uh, whether you guys bring up the trade or I bring it up, it, it, it's kind of exciting when we're all playing along together. Everybody's playing along at home and we kind of feel the ups and downs together. I think one of the things that I learned last year at the, it's kind of like last year at band camp, but last year at band camp at the Charlie Kirk retreat, I really got jazzed and energized being around other traders. And I was giving my little dog and pony and one of you guys, Larry, I don't know if you're here today, but Larry's like, Hey, you know, you just hit a profit target on this stock or it's up big, whatever the case may be. And it was almost like he was a shield in the audience and it got me excited and it got me jazzed. And then, we went down to the beach and one was getting close to a profit target and I didn't have a VPN on my phone. And one of the girls there, I was like, well, I'll watch it for you and I'll let you know. And she let me know and it was getting pretty close. And I went to the hotel, made a trade, got got out of half and went back to the beach and grabbed a beer and had some fun. And so I really enjoyed being around a bunch of traders. And this is something that I think we get a, we're going to probably eventually do. My wife's been kind of nudging me in that direction to do it with you guys and girls. And I think it would be fun. And maybe we could just do it on a small scale if you guys wanted to meet up in New Orleans or something. I think it's good to create a community of traders uh, as I hope this group becomes. And as I think it's becoming really quickly, it wasn't my original intention, but by accident, I think it's becoming what I ultimately want. And that is a mastermind group. And I'm pretty excited about that. Anyway, so you could see that on this trade, with a little bit of discretion, you would be up $205 on half of those shares, and then you would have taken off $701. That's a conservative figure because it was up a little bit more than 35 for quite a while, clo closing in on that initial profit target. So instead of making $410 for the week, you would make $906 with just a tiny bit of discretion and maybe even a little bit better than that. Again, I wanted to be conservative. So here's one that went down, but luckily this was a shard. And we are also free rolling on this position. So the initial position was 200 shares, but half have been sold for a $1,000 profit per 100K or 1%, however you want to look at that. And for the week, it was $132 gain. Now here's another one that's not really setting the world on fire. It dipped after the trigger, but for the week, it's up four cents. <laughs> so that's $17. And then here's CUE, and let's see what it's doing today. Oh, it's up nicely, so, so far so good on that one. But for the week coming into today, it was up 10 cents. So it would probably be up, you're up about $500 now on that instead of $47, knock on wood. But for the week, you're up a tiny bit on that one. Now here's a gold stock that we are not free rolling on. And this one has been up and down quite a bit. But even though it's going up and down and sideways quite a bit, we're going to hold the course or stay the course, I should say. And if you multiply the 371 where we started, and you take, if you take, if you look at where we ended, 382 minus 371, 
that's 11 cent gain. And you multiply that, looks like my math's a little bit off on that. So it's 286, actually slightly better than that, closer to $300 for the week on this position. Now this is a full position. We haven't hit that initial profit target. So where does this leave us? Well, we had quite a few losing trades for the week, or I should say gave up quite a bit of open profits. And some of those are open losses for the week. But overall, we actually did okay. And AUI would give us another 10 bucks or so. So this is how it shook out for the week. So you have to kind of be willing to take the bad with the good. And I think one of the things I'm kind of backing into as I was putting all this together, and as I alluded to a minute ago, is that if you focus too much on the negatives, especially since the negatives have, let's just say, twice the impact of a positive, from an emotional standpoint, you could easily or quickly end up like a deer in the headlights. And I think that could possibly scare you out of some of these positions that are continuing to be big winners. Now I have some random ruminations on all this. And I think the number one thing is try not to think about giving up those open profits. And then last minute, I put this in here. I know it's kind of like, don't think about elephants. <laughs> it's kind of hard not to. And I go through the same exact emotions and probably if anything, I have a disadvantage because I'm so damn emotional. And that's been proven. Just ask anybody who knows me, but I've proven that through a personality test, something I would strongly urge you do. Curtis Faith, who's an interesting character, but I, I do, or I did, I should say, enjoy his books, at least the, I think he's only written two. The Way of the Turtle, I want to say is one, and Trading from the Gut. Both of those are on davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. And I'll make 30 cents, maybe if that much, if you buy them off my website. And I appreciate that. Help support the website. Anyway, I did enjoy his books very much. I, I, I think I've told the story a thousand times, but I swore I would never read any of the turtle books. And then Larry Macmillan told me that that one's actually pretty good because they talked about the fact that they had a, a ping pong table in the back of the office. And when there was nothing to do, instead of firing off trades unnecessarily, they play ping pong. And if my office was big enough, I think I'd put a ping pong table in here symbolically. But since we've downsized, that's no longer possible. I think I could have got one in the other office. Anyway. Now, the other thing you need to do is take a longer term approach. Where are you on a net net basis? Now, I realize there's a danger in looking over that one week period because drawdowns might go for much longer than a week. In fact, they often go for much longer than a week. But if you could maybe look a little bit further out than that one week, for instance, like there'll be times where I'm kind of bummed out because I've been in a drawdown for, let's say, a month or two. But if I back my statements out or back my brokerage little graph out and I see that the arrow is pointing up and my equity going back six months rather nicely, I just need to chill out. I know. Uh -huh. Relax and then just make sure I'm prudent on everything. Get stopped out and get stopped out. And if we end up on a net net basis much better than we were then we need to thank the trading gods and just keep on keeping on now i read the book about the kelly formula which i found really interesting i do have a problem with the kelly formula because it's based on pure statistics which pure statistics don't work in the overall market if they did you'd own the world if you are on a hot streak, the Kelly formula will be the quickest way to make money. Larry Williams used the Kelly formula when he won the trading competition by turning $10,000 into a million bucks. And I think he was trading mostly opening gap reversals in S&P futures. The interesting part or the rest of the story there, the Paul Harvey rest of the story there is that 
he was up over two million at one point during the year, and he finished the year up a million. Now that's a that's a huge feat. You can't take that away from him. But in his own words, it's kind of funny. He says, yeah, that's the year my wife said I lost a million dollars. So that's the danger of something like the Kelly formula. I know I'm, I'm being I'm backing into something here, but Fortune's Formula, I think is the name of that book. Linda Rasky had recommended it, and it's a good read. I'd recommend you read it. Just be really careful if you decide to implement the Kelly. If you did, and, and I might actually do this, and I'm kind of doing it inadvertently in a small account so like if i'm buying a thousand shares in a big account i've been like throwing a few hundred shares into a small account just for s and g's and i've got one little account that's been running up really nicely but i think it's going to be a live by the sword die by the sword because i had a couple of bad days recently and it really hurt so just be really careful use that anyway i didn't want to go off on the kelly formula but in that book they talked about the fact they did admit that if you're using the kelly formula formula, you're going to spend a lot of time less wealthy. Well, I think that really goes for trend trading because nine out of 10 times or quite often, I should say, you're giving up open profits. And then Greg Morris, and he's talking about the overall market, but the overall market, he said that the overall market only makes new highs about 4% of the time. So you will spend a lot of time less wealthy. You have to learn to live with that. Now, as you saw earlier, a discretion on a near miss can greatly improve performance. And there's a few other discretionary things you could do. Sometimes they cut both ways, but longer term discretion does pay off, but you would have pretty, and I know it's just a small microcosm, but you would have pretty much doubled your returns for the week with just a little bit of discretion by taking those partial profits a little bit early. My initial goal in putting these together, and I kind of ended up going off in a few tangents imagine that but my initial goal was to getting back to the best trade of the week the worst trade of the week and the missed trade of the week which i do over in the stock chart show and which will spill over into this show is that instead of just showing like hey this great setup that i found and we took it and we made a bunch of money or this setup that i was stupid to take in the first place why not show what I did right during the week by doing nothing, okay, in the case of a lot of those that just went up that we wanted to go up, or taking partial profits when I was supposed to, and applying a little discretion when necessary. In other words, following the process, following the process, following the process. And again, getting back to the the plethora of trading problems that I've been presented with from you guys on my website, from those trading problems submitted so far, and I'm about halfway through putting my slides together, but it looks like on nearly all of them, it's a procedural problem or a process problem, okay? I'm writing stocks down to zero. Well, you know what you're doing wrong. It's like the doctor, doctor joke, don't do that. All right, let's see what one of the Chris's are saying, or CJ, I think it's he's not going to go by. I think it's easy to come to grips with the fact that all trades end badly. Yes, and that's something, I'm glad you said that, because that's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And one of you guys says, well, Dave, that's kind of negative to put it all trades end badly. Maybe say it doesn't end optimally. And I think that begins to kind of muddy the waters a little bit when you start using terms like optimally and things like that, because very hard to to get it perfectly right in the markets. And in fact, I think one of the many secrets that's not like some guru claiming he has the holy grail or whatever, one of the many real secrets of the markets is embracing that imperfect nature and realize you're not gonna sell that exact high and that trailing stop, you're gonna give up a big old hunk of money in the end. But if you make a lot of money on a net net basis, you know, like we're up 115%, I think, in KOD, not to beat the dead horse on that one. But by the time we get stopped out, we're probably gonna give up a lot of those open profits just because we have a stop far away give it a lot of room. Now, if our stop survives and it goes on to double again, in the end, we're still going to get up, give up an S ton of open profits. All right, cut Chris off. 
So Chris says, I think it's easy to come up to come to grips with the fact that all trades end badly. Amen. The struggle becomes how badly do we want them to end? Well, that's the thing. It's like, I don't want to lose any money. It's like somebody was asking me, where's your stop? You you recommended this IPO. Where's your stop? Or it was um, OCFT, I think. And I think a lot of you guys were playing along in the Facebook group. And they had a really good run up. And then it began to draw down. We took partial profits. But then it's like, oh, geez. And it's like, I really didn't want to lose more than a couple of bucks on the trade, but I had to at least give it that much room. And I think it's since turned around. So maybe even more room would have worked better. But I don't want to lose anything on a trade. So you have to come to grips with that giving up of the open profits. And you have to be like Dennis, what's his name? Richard Dennis, like, hey, that's uh, that comes with the territory. I know, easier said than done. The struggle becomes how badly do we want them to end? I occasionally scale out in thirds. I find this helps me to be able to hold on the final third with less apprehension, understanding that everything is a trade-off and the home run trades will turn into only triples or doubles. Well, that's fine. You know, it's selling down to sleeping level and that's what I did with the KOD trade, okay? Because the original position worked out so well, it's a good problem to have, don't get me wrong, but if you have a huge big winner like that yes by all means go ahead and scale out of a little bit more because it's this thing ran from 29 or whatever it was to 70 something dollars it's okay to unload a little bit at 70 something dollars because you know it's probably going to pull back 20 points on you okay at some point so yeah by all means sell down to the sleeping level in general though and if you look at it statistically, you're going to have more often than not, you're going to have a lot of singles, singles meaning, I guess, a baseball analogy, meaning that you make a little bit of money, but not a whole lot. You hit that initial profit target and then maybe stop out or maybe go a little further and stop out at a profit, a nice little profit overall. So on those, I wouldn't be so quick to sell out a third. Only on the occasional big home run. I think that you're you're better off maybe selling out at a third. If you are trading properly, you know, I was thinking this morning, it's like I'm looking at the how many, okay, I got a thousand shares here, six hundred shares here, five hundred shares here. Okay, do I have another five hundred shares of that same stock, another account? Blah, blah. I mean, I'm trying to add it all up and keep it straight. And I was talking to one of you via private messages, because I've been more and more open about a lot of things that I'm doing based on Dalio's radical transparency from his book, Principles, which is also in the books read thing. So I'm trying to become more and more open. And it's, it's taken me a while to get there, but I'm working on it. But anyway, it's like I was thinking about it this morning, just trying to add up what I have where and, and where my exposure is and so on and so forth. And it seems like your positions are always too small on your winners and always too big on your losers. And that's just... It is what it is. But I think that if you're trading at a 2% max loss and you're taking profits at 1% and you're trailing that stop loosely, you just kind of have to wrap your head around the fact that there's going to be drawdowns along the way. And unless you have a huge gain, kind of a long-winded answer or reply, I should say back to you, CJ. But unless you have a huge gain, I think you're better off holding on to just half of those shares. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting is that position will be big enough if that market does begin to rally because percentage wise, the equity of your account will rise with that position. Okay, so let's say you put in, you put up 2%, let's say you buy a stock at 30, it goes to 60. Well, you sold, even if you sold half, you still have at 60, you still have percentage wise as far as the equity, total equity. Okay. Not that you want to let the stock go to zero, but total equity is now the same as it was when you got started. So you can see how, as a position moves more and more in your favor, then percentage of equity of your account with that one position goes up. And that's the beauty of the scaling out is. You're constantly risk on, risk off, adjusting those 
parameters. Scaling out after the first half swing. Yeah, I agree. I hear what you're saying, Chris. Believe me, I, I know what you're saying. And I would only scale out after the first half. Now, I hear you. Statistically, you're probably going to be a lot more accurate doing that and make a lot more money until the occasional big winner. And that's what we're playing for is that occasional outlier. But yeah, if that works for you, that's fine. But I think longer term, you'd be better off keeping that bigger position on that second low. But yeah, over the short term, intermediate and not so intermediate term, your equity curve might look a heck of a lot better. All right, let's get to these resolutions. I should have just probably held these off for next week. Let's get to these 20 resolutions. Now we left off, we were on 10. And when I was working on my resolutions or polishing these up a little bit for my stock chart show, I got to thinking that we could probably elaborate a lot more on micromanagement. Now, in this format, I'm, I have a little bit more time, but I do try to keep it within a certain time frame. but I have some flexibility. But in a stock chart show, it's done like a, an actual episode of whatever, <laughs> an actual episode where we have a very tight time schedule. But the more I think about it, there's so much I wanna cover and that's where the flexibility of the weekend charts comes in. I'm able to spend more time doing these. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that when I explain to the stock charts people, the people watching the show, is that it's going to take us a while to get through all these resolutions because every one of these resolutions can be a show in and of itself or maybe even multiple shows. So basically with number 10, I'm saying don't micromanage. And I've done tons of shows on micromanagement. Now I just grabbed this CMRE, one of the winners in the portfolio, and we had a buy signal. And then a few days later, you might be thinking, I better take profits on this because it's a fat abandoned baby being squished by a sumo wrestler top, which is also known as a three birds crapping on a wire. If you're a Candles fan, you should recognize all these little patterns here and get out, right? No, you stay the course. And you're saying, well, Dave says stay the course. Well, this thing is going sideways. And here I am two weeks later, three weeks later, I'm underwater on this trade. Maybe I should get out. It's dead money. No, stay the course. As I preach, micromanagement will pay over the short term, but not longer term. So in a case like this, if you're a brainiac and try to outsmart the market, you would have lost on this trade but by staying the course taking a dumb approach okay a trend following moron approach and just let it go don't be frozen <laughs> you'll do quite well longer term okay now when you have open profits it's a good thing but you got to be really careful about mentally monetizing i know this morning i'm looking at sndl and it's like i've got couple thousand shares here, a couple thousand shares there, here a thousand, there a thousand. I'm trying to add it all up and I'm looking at the equity and it's like, man, this thing is up 30 cents or whatever. That's actually a lot of money. And then it went negative, you know? So it's like, that's what I was, one of the things I was telling my wife. She's like, how's that pot penny stock doing? I'm like, ah, I was doing great this morning and now I'm losing money, you know? So you gotta be really careful, especially if you're mentally monetizing. If you mentally monetize, it's going to put you into a state of regret. Now, those who aren't familiar with mentally monetizing, if you trade for more than one day, you probably will know what it is. And when you're up a couple thousand dollars on a position, you're like, oh man, that's great. A couple thousand dollars. I could do this with that, or I could take that and have some fun. You monetize that those gains into something tangible. And as we said earlier, a lot of times you're going to be less wealthy, meaning that you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits. And there's probably a quote in here. I could probably noodle out if I worked on a little bit. It's like, trend following is being less wealthy so you can become more wealthy. We'll work on that, but that's that's pretty cool. I'm kind of patting myself on the back here. So you gotta be careful the mentally monetizing because for instance, you know, I'm guilty as charged. I don't come up here holier than now. I mean, I'm thinking, okay, I've got a few thousand dollars in a sundial. I can do this with that or whatever. That'd be kind of fun. And then now I'm losing money. Well, you put yourself in a state of regret because when, not if, that drawdown comes, you're thinking, well, now I can't. 
And it's also a lose-lose situation. So let's say at the end of the day, this thing rallies up, hopefully to 420, which I jokingly just, I said, hey, I hope it goes to 420. Little irony there, right? But I went ahead and put a limit order in <laughs> just for S&Gs at 420 to sell out some shares. Let's, let's just see what happens, you know? Anyway, so let's say you do take those open profits because you were inspired to take them because you thought that you could take that money and go have some fun or pay your mortgage or whatever bill you have. And you do that and you feel pretty good for a day and then you watch the stock take off without you. And instead of paying that mortgage, you could have paid off your mortgage, okay? It's a bit of an exaggeration, but it could happen. Now, Kenny and Rogers might be a pain in the arse to play cards with. If you've ever seen that Geico commercial, it's quite funny. But he is right on one thing. Don't count your money while you're sitting at the table. There will be time enough for counting when the trade is done. Now, again, I hold myself out in that self, in a self-deprecating manner as a trend following moron. But any time I try to outsmart the market, I seem to have my ass handed to me. So just take a dumb approach. Let that stop take you out if you're wrong. Let that stop keep you in if you're right. I mean, that's almost a mic drop moment. I would drop my mic, but I've broken too many mics by making that stupid joke. So as usual, you want to risk 2%. Now you have to work up to that 2% number. Don't start trading tomorrow and just jump right in at 2%. Maybe start at a quarter of a percent or something that's really meaningless. And I've seen people, as I've said before, like one guy I know, he's been around the industry for a while, but he wasn't a trader. And then he made the leap over to become a trader. And when he did that, he was quite successful. And I asked him, I was like, well, how did you make the leap? I know you've learned a lot through osmosis over the years by working with all these guys, but how did you make that leap and hit the ground running and come out successful? And he's like, well, Dave, I'm really risking very, very, very small amounts. And so he's like, I get the whole psychology game. And so that's how he became successful instantly. And I haven't checked in with him lately, but it looks like he's doing okay. He's kind of working his way up from there. Now, obviously, we're going to take partial profits when you're up 1% overall on the position. So 100K, just to keep the math easy. If you're up $2,000 on a position, you're going to take half of those profits, $1,000 off, okay? And what's cool about that is it's going to free up a lot of margin, at least half of the position of margin. And that's it, obviously the initial profit target. And then as I preach with the money management, you trail a stop, allowing it to gradually loosen on the remainder, and that's to make the transition to the longer-term trend trader. And then one thing that I do, if you must mentally monetize, and it's hard not to mentally monetize, I know, because your brokerage, the flashing lights in your brokerage showing you how much you're up or how much you're down. It's hard not to mentally monetize, but what I try to do is like, okay, if I get stopped out in this position, how am I going to do? And be willing to ride that stock down to that stop and it sucks it really does it sucks in the end but what's interesting is as i've said a thousand times i've been in positions where i've had a stop so far away it just freaking hurts and it gets hit and i cuss and i fuss and then by accident two or three years later i'll pull the chart and see that that stock has quadrupled from where i got stopped out so an even looser stop not in all cases but in some cases an even looser stop would have kept you into that great fantastic trend so the point I'm trying to get here to here is that it's just parts of the game, giving up those open profits. And that seems to be the, by accident, we kind of backed into that this week, but that's sort of the, the lesson of the week is that it's okay to give up some of those open profits. Now here's a dead horse one. I will seek excitement and entertainment outside of the market. I'm here by myself. If I'm not careful, I will get myself into a lot of trouble trading. And I'm going to make sure that I'm not trading for excitement. If you want excitement, go to Vegas. At least there, a pretty girl will bring you a drink. Or as I often joke, have an affair. That way you only lose half of your money. As I preach, busy people make for good traders, especially with my methodology. If you boil it all down, you're only trading a few minutes a day. Now, your analysis does take a little time to do. If you don't have someone like Big Dave doing it for you. But again, the trading part itself only takes a few minutes of your day. 
Because every time, let's say you're making observations that are unnecessary, you can't count that as time that was needed, right? So busy people do make good traders. And the example that I've given ad nauseum is that my trading recently got a lot bad. I'm like, well, what did you do? Did you discover this pattern or some money management or are you trading IPOs and IPOs are hot or wheat stocks and wheat stocks are hot? Or, you know, what would you do? Because I want to learn from you because you've been trading with me for a long time and you haven't done so well. But now all of a sudden you're doing pretty good. He says, well, one of my doctors quit and now I have to work day and night. I got to cover her shift at the hospital. So I'm tired. I'm busy. I don't have enough time to Microsoft, Microsoft, micromanage myself out of positions and I'm just letting them run. And all of a sudden I'm making a lot more money. I also don't have time to fire off day trades. And you know what? That was a detriment to my account. Now, for me, I keep myself crazy busy. I did not get a lot of things that I wanted done this morning before my show. I didn't get to promote the show. I was too busy to do that. Just a lot of things, a lot of loose ends. I mean, I am slammed. And a lot of times I'm here dust to dawn, but I'm not trading like a crazy man. Now, if I forget about my to-do list and start watching a screen, I will be because I know myself. But I keep myself purposely busy. And usually that has not, you know, every now and then it, it, it does hurt me a little bit by doing that. Like last week, during a week of charts, I did get a profit target in and stops in properly and position actually hurt me. But for the most part, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, staying busy like I am today keeps me out of a lot of trouble. The more you observe, the more unnecessary action that you will take and the more likely you will put yourself into a state of regret. And that's even on winning positions. As I said this morning, okay, I kind of let it get to me that I was up kind of big in one and now it's actually down. This is a, a beautiful saying. I don't know who said it originally. If one of you guys wants to Google it, I keep forgetting to Google it. But you really need to be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. I mean, if you're going to be a crazy day trader, in and out, in and out, in and out 100 times a day, if that's what your forte is, even though I think it's bad longer term, as I've said before, I've given a speech to a group of day traders, and the I was the oldest one there by a factor of two, probably. The oldest one, other than me, was probably 30 years old, and they were all filled with lots of testosterone and very dangerous thing to do. And a lot of them blew up, blew up, blew up, come back, blow up, come back, blow up. I think you can only stomach that so many times in your life. So be as close to the market as you need to be, even though closer. And if you do have to be close to the market, figure out a way to be less close to the market. So if you're going to be a day trader, figure out a way to where you can put those trades on and ride them out for as much of the day as possible, as opposed to being in and out, in and out, like the little rat going for cocaine. Number 12, I would accept what the market is willing to give. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit, as we tell the, the youngins, the, the whippersnappers. I guess I'm getting old enough now to start using those words. <laughs> In your life, if you are successful, which you probably are, if you have enough money to trade, you've probably made some money. And the reason you made that money or how you made that money or one of the big factors in making that money was the fact that you had a lot of control over the situation. In the market, you don't have that. The serenity prayer comes to mind. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You have to be careful not to pray the genius prayer, <laughs> which is pearls before swine, which basically says, I forget exactly how it goes, but it's pretty funny. The wisdom to know I'm different and that, uh, anyway. I digress. I'll have to look that up. I'll put it in the uh, edited version of this. 13 is a biggie, and it's something that I glossed over quite a bit, and it always does me good to get out. And I've talked on and off about postmortems, but I'm never really going into details on them. It's something I probably need to flesh out a lot further. But when I was in San Francisco last fall, speaking to the TSAA, Technical Analysis Society over there, great society, by the way, I talked a little bit about postmortems, and it really struck a card with one of the attendees, and he just asked me a whole bunch of questions about him, and it's really got me thinking about him, and I've been talking quite a bit about postmortems 
ever since. Now, just FYI, you have to be careful not to confuse a, a post-mortem with post-malone. Those are two different things. There's one of you out there that will probably get the joke, but at least one person gets it. Anyway, in talking with this gentleman in San Francisco, I got to think, and this is something that I really need to flesh out a lot more. So that's something that I will be doing more and more. And you basically, you just need to ask yourself, if maybe I'm making it more complex than it needs to be by fleshing it out further. But you just need to ask yourself, did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Annie Duke wrote a good book. I, I refer to it often, especially in these webinars called Thinking in Bets. I would urge you to read it. The first half of the book got me so excited, like she's going to solve this problem. And she just kind of ends it with a few common sense things. And I was a little let down. But overall, it was a fantastic book. The bottom line is you need to work hard to separate luck from skill. And if you figure that out, write me a letter, okay? It's not necessarily easy because, as I often say, good decisions could have bad outcomes and bad decisions could have good outcomes. And that borrows from Terrence O'Dean, who talks about outcomes being noisy. And that's something I talk about quite often. Now, this used to happen to me a lot. It doesn't happen as much. But it still does on occasion. If you find yourself thinking, what the hell was I thinking when you look back at a trade after it's all said and done, after the dust settles, and you're thinking, what the hell was I thinking, then that's fantastic. You are on your way. Now, the second level of that, as you're climbing up this hierarchy of master trader ladder, I guess I got to be careful not to say that too fast. <laughs> kind of like a baker, you know, you become a, it doesn't matter. Anyway, if you find yourself thinking, well, in hindsight, I just got lucky on that one, okay? That's fantastic. It's hard to make money and not think that you're some genius for making that money. And I see it all the time. And I try to tell people, that'll work until it don't. That'll work until it don't. I see people do stupid things with a lot of risk. And it's like, well, it's been working for the last couple of years. I'm just keep doing it. You know, it's like, okay, well, call me in a year. Let me know how it works. And I never hear back from them. They fall off the face of the earth. So you got to be careful and realize that sometimes after you after the dust settles, you look at the trade, and realize it just was a stupid trade to begin with, and you just got lucky. That's the next layer of enlightenment. And the third highest layer of enlightenment is when you actually have a negative outcome on a trade. And you say, you know what? You know, maybe drop an F bomb when you get stopped out or whatever, but a day or two later, look at your charts, back them out to day one, do your analysis and say, okay, let me just pretend I'm just seeing this from the for the first time. And you say, you know what? I lost in this trade, but if I saw that same setup tomorrow, I'd take it in a heartbeat. So that basically is kind of circling back to following the process. And that's huge. So when you get to that level, you're getting it. Number 14, I will reward myself for following the proper process. That kind of dovetails nicely here, regardless of the outcome. I think I just said that. And that's hard. And as I said a thousand times and probably will say a thousand more, the market can be a really bad teacher, lulling you into a false sense of confidence. The other thing it does too, is it always makes you think, if I would have just put that entry in 10 cents higher, then I wouldn't have triggered into a trade. Well, maybe, maybe that's correct, okay? But again, you have to look at it and decide whether or not that was the right thing to do and not try to make a rule for everything that happens. And I see it happen with the newbies all the time. It's like, oh, I see, you should have just entered five cents higher and then you wouldn't have triggered in that trade. It's like, nah, it's, that's not always the case. So again, separating luck from skill, and that comes with experience. But just remember, a lot of the experience won't be useful in the markets because the market, again, is a bad teacher. I will hold myself accountable. Heavy is the head that wears a crown. We have, we have unlimited freedom in this business. It is the most exciting and wonderful thing ever. Unfortunately, we have so much freedom that we have to hold ourselves accountable, and that's not an easy thing to do. And as I said before, let me just try to get the get the anecdote out as quick quickly as possible. I've 
looked at people's trading records and when I, cause they can't figure out what they're doing wrong. And when I tell them what they're doing wrong, they're like, well, I know, I know, I know. I just, you know, I know it, it just forces them to admit it. Another case was, Hey, you know what you're doing? You're a good stock picker. You've got the money management down. You're doing a really good job. And then you kind of blow up. You kind of go off the rails and it kind of goes through your head you start taking these mediocre trades and blah 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 you can blow up these accounts well in this case it was like small accounts based on his wealth like twenty five thousand dollar accounts and he just kept sweeping them under the rug and i said what if you were to open up a new account and tell your wife hey this is what i'm doing this is the plan i'm going to follow big dave isn't always right in fact he's wrong a lot but longer term he seems to do okay I'm going to follow his methodology. I'm going to follow his money management. I'm going to follow these setups. This is what I'm going to do. And it's in get her involved and, and show her that you're doing what you said you're going to do. Show her that sometimes you lose money, sometimes you make money. And it went on and on through the whole process. He says, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So he knew he was doing the wrong thing. And more often than not, you know what you're doing wrong. Provided you've been trading for a little while, obviously. Number 16, I'll embrace my emotions. As I often preach, as I learned from Denise Shaw and later on from Descartes, every decision has emotions attached. And I went ahead and added stress too. It also has a consequence. So the stress and emotions come from the possible consequence of that action. So today I'm thinking I can go have me a really fattening lunch, but that's gonna that's gonna make me feel good for a little while, but I'm stressed over going to do that because I'm gonna be sleepy this afternoon and maybe I should go exercise instead. And so every decision has an emotion and consequence and stress involved. So as I preach, you can't escape emotions. If you had no emotions, you'd be dead in a day. In fact, people that don't have emotions, they have to keep them in an institution because they're not physically stable. You need emotions. And that's one thing that in more recent years, I spent more and more time doing. In fact, literally I got to move it on the floor. I've got a neuroscience journal, probably weighs about 20 pounds. <laughs> it's a doorstop, right? I got it on the floor of my office because I'm still kind of moving again. I've been moving in for months here. And I got to watch, I literally don't trip over it. But that's one thing that's, that's been one of my epiphanies in more recent years is to start wrapping my head around all this neurology now you don't have to be a neuroscientist basically just a, a basic knowledge of it really helps but it makes you realize that we're physically not made to do this activity and the more epiphanies you have there the more you realize how unnatural it is but the more you can embrace the unnatural nature of trading and just do it number 17 i will keep a journal of my trading actions and my feelings. So tracking your trades, not hugely important, but, but I would recommend you do it. But more importantly, is your emotions going in? And last year at Bandcamp at Charlie Kirk's retreat, one of the guys there said that he actually has a confession journal. And anytime he does something he's not supposed to, he puts it in his confession journal. I just put mine in my trading journal. And I write the word shame. <laughs> And if I drop an F-bomb, I write it in a trading journal just to know whether or not I'm getting unnecessarily emotional. L.R. Thomas, as I often quote, and I've seen this more, more than one place, but I'll give her credit. Don't expect trading to fill a hole missing in your life. And that's all important in a trading journal. So in addition to, the reason I'm saying that is in addition to your thoughts on the markets, maybe write down a little bit about what's going on in your life. Now, one thing that I've done, started doing about a year ago, I don't have to see how far they go back, but I filled up a, probably a half a dozen notebooks so far, is I get up and I write until I fill three pages of a notebook, three handwritten pages of a notebook. And I've talked about this quite often. I'm trying to think of the Cameron, I think it's Julia Cameron. I think I have her name right. And she wrote a book called The Artist's Way, which got lost in the move, but it's somewhere around here. And I read about the first 10 pages of the book, and she recommended doing that. And that's something I did many years ago. I actually found a few of my old notes where I used to wake up and do that every day. I called it a brain dump back then. 
well, she just calls it morning pages, but that's been a real godsend. And that's helped me to wrap my head around the emotions of what's going on in your life. And it's like, you're always going to have problems and emotions and deadlines and commitments and, you know, what to leave in and what to leave out or whatever else. <laughs> but anyway, it's very good to wrap your head around, very good, good to get that out of your head. And if you take that journal, that morning journal, those morning pages, and you look at your trading journal and you look at your equity curve and you look at your performance, you're going to quickly see how they're all related. And you're going to question stupid things that you're doing. Like I've made some stupid ogre trades recently that I don't think I should have taken. So that trade, that in addition to my trading journal, those morning pages, waking up thinking about those losses, coming into the day with a loss that I, you know, and here's another thing that I feel like I have to make up. Got to be careful of that pressure too. But if I write all that down and get it out of my head, life gets a lot easier. And, you know, the other thing too, not to get sidetracked, imagine that me going off on a tangent, but I think that's, I think that's why that the Facebook group has been so good for me. Dr. Robert Marr, I wrote a book called The Kaizen Way, and it's about making little steps in your life. But if you listen to his lectures, and he, he was lecturing, I was at a conference where he was, I was speaking at a conference where he also spoke, and I really enjoyed his, his talk. But one thing that that he touches upon a lot is that we need we need each other. And uh, I didn't see that so much in the Kaizen way. I'm going to have to reread that book. My goal is to go back and outline a few of these books and actually do what the book suggests. But in his lectures, he does talk a lot about the importance of needing one another. So, and that's something I'm just kind of thinking about on the fly here, but maybe that's why the group has been so good for me. And it looks like it's been good for a lot of you guys too. It's because we we do need to be around each other. And, we, and it's very important that we have a, kind of a support system, our families, our friends, our trading buddies, our mastermind group. So I think that's something that's important. I think we isolate ourselves too much as traders. And maybe that's a something that I need to flesh out a little bit further. Number 18, before I forget, I will believe in what I see and not in what I believe. How many times have I said that? Obviously, the market can only exist in three states. It could, be going, it could be going up, easy for me to say, which means demand. It could be going down, meaning there's supply. Or it could be going sideways, meaning that there's a state of equilibrium. Demand is meeting supply. Always true, you're, truly ask yourself, which is it? Well, right now, we could draw a big blue arrow. We'll do that in a few minutes when we get the live charts. And as I often say, it might not be what you want, and often it's not. But what is, is, unless, of course, you're Bill Clinton. I guess that's getting too old. You guys are probably too young to uh, remember that. Define the word is. What is, is? It's like oh. <laughs> Chewbacca theory. You know, it's like your head's exploding when he was saying that. I think that's where Chewbacca theory may have come from, you know. <laughs> Chewbacca lives on a, on a planet with Ewoks. And Ewoks are like little bitty, little bitty fellas. But Chewbacca is like huge. So it makes no sense. You just gotta have to quit. <laughs> I think that was the South Park Johnny Cochran Chewbacca theory. And then because we had after I got married, because we had a young uh, girl in the house, a toddler, my wife cut me off from South Park. So I haven't watched South Park in, in many, many, many years. It was funny. I was talking like Larry McMillan or something. He's like he's watched every single one of them. I thought I was just a, a too, you know, too old and a big kid. But anyway. Before I digress too far, number 19, I will read my 3x5 trading card before each and every trade. I didn't read it yesterday, and I took a stupid trade. I'm kind of kicking myself <laughs> in the butt. As I've been preaching lately, that card says, I, Dave Landry, will take the best ogre and trend trades, even if this means passing on an okay opportunity and watching it take off occasionally without me paraphrasing of course as i preach you want to make a, a big change in your life make a small change and we talked about this before the big part of your brain which most people think of when they think of a brain what a brain looks like the cortex which is which has left and right sides and a bunch of little parts to it 
But for the most part, it looks like a brain, as, as you think. And then there's that little primal part of your brain, which is actually buried underneath all that. And if you look at an alligator's brain or a lizard, it looks a lot like that. They don't have that big cortex sitting on top of that lizard brain. They just have pretty much the lizard brain, okay? Well, that lizard brain makes you do stupid shit. <laughs> What's a redneck say right before he gets killed? Watch this. <laughs> what does he say right before that? Hold my beer. Anyway, the rest of what's sloshing around up there keeps you from doing stupid shit. Now, it's really a battle between the two, but if you embrace your amygdala and the rest of that limbic system and all those little parts that make up that primal brain, your life is going to get a lot easier. And here's the neurology freshman neurology we're in its ugly head. How long does it take to get from that little bitty brain up there to the rest of what's sloshing around up there? It only takes two to three seconds. And that's why making a little small change to not wake up that panic monster, that's barred from wait, but why? And you might want to Google that. That's a funny presentation on procrastination. He's, he's pretty good. But you can get, you could bypass that part of your brain, tiptoe past that panic monster, so to speak, to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there, just by taking a quick little break and reading that card. As I've said before, if you want to make a big change in your life, just make a small change. And the example I've given recently is my pudgy friends, and they're all died again. I'll just stay away from them now. <laughs> they make these drastic changes, and then. They they used to come over and bore the hell out of us. They used to be a lot of fun to hang out with. And they still are once they once they get off the wagon again or fall off the wagon or whatever this latest phase is. But they'll come over and they're all hungry and <laughs> gaunt and anyway, peckish. And then we'll see them partying like rock stars a few weeks later. They'll just their body will reject it. Well, your body has this thing called homeostasis that keeps you alive. It rejects these massive drastic changes. So if you want to make a big change, make a small change. Well, think about the biggest losers. The biggest losers are, are now the biggest gainers. I was going to make some jokes, but I guess I better not. See, I'm gravitationally challenged, so I can make jokes about fat people. <laughs> anyway, a lot of those biggest losers have gained more than they lost. And there's there's actually some physio physiology, if I said that right, involved with that, with the metabolism and all. But even that aside, the bottom line is your body resists drastic change. And Mara says, okay, well, he's got people that are overweight and they've tried everything. And one girl in particular, he says, you know what? I just want you to stand up for 30 seconds tonight when you're watching TV. Just one commercial. Just stand up through one commercial. And just do that every night and see if you can get to a point where you're standing during all commercials. and then." While you're standing there, just march. Just march while the commercials are on. And in doing that every night, it didn't really shock her brain or anything and, and wake up that panic monster down there in that limbic system and get that amygdala all tied in a knot. And before long, she started a, a more and more and more and more, very gradual though, vigorous exercise routine. And she lost the weight and she's in great shape. Anyway. So make a small change. Sometimes just reading that stupid little card before you trade will be enough to bypass that emotional part of your brain to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. Number 20, which will be 21 next year, I will go to www.davelander.com slash 20 dash trading dash resolutions dash far dash 2020 dash and dash beyond dash one dash 10 and then click to the second part of the article, print off the article and refer to it often in 2020. This is something that I've been kind of thinking about and working on lately. And let's say you, in your head, you're thinking, oh, I wanna, I want, cause I, like I'm a pretty good cook when it comes to certain things. Like I do like a really good hoisin pork. So it's like, sometimes I go to the store, it's like, okay, I'll, I'm gonna, I think I want hoisin pork tonight. Well, sometimes I'll come home and realize I didn't buy pork chops. <laughs> Or I'll come home and realize I didn't buy hoisin sauce, okay? If you make a list of those items and forget it at home, I would say you're probably twice to maybe five times more likely to actually remember to get the hoisin, 
poison sauce and the pork, okay, at the store and whatever else you may need. I think if you actually have the list on you, it's nearly impossible to forget those items, especially if you check them off. So there's a lot of neurology here in rereading these 20 resolutions. Make them your own, make your own, okay? You don't have, they don't have to use mine exactly. But I don't think it would hurt to follow these 20 resolutions in 2020. And I think you do pretty good. And, and, you know, just recognize when you're violating those rules by going back in and rereading them often. And again, make a little change. Just come up with your own little trading card and go from there. Okay. Um, if you ever want to see, I will, my goal is to not show you anything that I did not A, recommend before I got in it. Okay either through the Facebook group or in most cases like today's, all of today's charts came directly from the trading service. So if you wanna look at those archives, obviously if you're in the Facebook group, which if you're under the members area of the website, click right here to join, okay? And if you already joined it, it'll bring you to the group obviously. And again, you have to be a gold member. But if you go to the service page, take a look at the archives down here. If you're not on the service, you could go to, and I've shortened this to just archives, davelander.com slash archives, A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S, and that'll bring you to these. And I think I just updated them, so you should have all the way up until December there now. Less than a month, a month behind. All right, quick announcement. Everybody here is in the group, I think, but if you haven't joined Dave Lander members, do so. I can all but guarantee that it'll be worth the nominal charge for that. So check that out. DaveLander.com slash members, or if you see a banner on the homepage, click on it. Lots of good stuff there. My wife was shocked when I told her what the price was. She couldn't believe it. She's like, why are, you, why are you giving this away? I said, well, I want to build a group of lifelong learners. I want to build the mastermind group, and that's my ultimate goal here. And so far, it's been working out really good. I don't want to get too sappy on you guys, but it's been fantastic. So thank you for that. And I think everybody's benefiting from what I can see so far. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks. Feel free to do that. S&P 500, let's get to today. Well, this thing continues to climb the wall of worry. If you would tell me, oh, you know, we're popping bad guys in the Middle East and they're not really happy about it and they're shooting some missiles back at us and they're shooting down airliners by mistake or at least one president's impeached and now it's going to the Senate and what what else is going on? You know, it's like cats has been released. You know, it's like all these crazy things going on. What's the market doing? It's climbing the wall of worry. What is is and i know it's hard to wrap your head around that i have people friends of friends like for instance like a friend of my wife she's asking me about trading and i was like you're just gonna have to listen to what i say and what is is and she's asking me about the logic of it i'm like ah, there's no logic it's just emotions and you have to wrap your head around those emotions are we in a supply market or are we in a demand market or are we in a sideways market well doesn't take a rocket surgeon to draw a big blue arrow. A trend following moron could do that. And what do we see? We are headed higher. We are in a demand type of market. But Dave, when will it end? I don't know. I'm a trend follower. I just follow. Okay. We'll know it when we see it, as Justice, Justice Potter Stewart, I think, once said. NASDAQ composite up about eh, a little over a half percent today. If we close here, we close at what? All time high so far. So good. Rusty, kind of off to the races so far today. Up a percent and change. Not quite all time highs though, but hey, you know what? It's getting better and better. Let's see if we can grab just a quick idea. We're within about 2% or so of the all time high. So getting there. Gold, the commod gold, the stocks, I should say, trying to rally out of a pullback, not getting anywhere today. Gold, the commodity, nice little thrust higher, pulling back in here so far, kind of hanging in there, looking pretty good. Diddle for silver stocks, as you can see, 
one thing I want to point out is not all is fantastic in the world. Some areas like the banks are starting to look a little questionable in here, but for the most part, you got drugs breaking out to new highs. Biotech has been lagging a little bit shorter term, but it's hanging around those prior highs in here. I'd like to see new highs, you know me. But a lot of areas banging on new highs, health services, just the new highs, software, just the new highs, hardware, or as we call it now, Apple at brand new highs or thereabouts and headed higher. So, so far, so good. All right, Donald says, BYND, BYND, coming off base, formed around the closing highs, first five days, bow tied recently. Yeah, the bow tie is gonna be what I call a forced bow tie, meaning that when you have a really fast rally, it, it just bow ties real fast, okay? So I would consider that more of a first thrust than a bow tie. It's a little volatile and wild and crazy. Has anybody eaten the, one of these things? I, they had one, I saw one at the grocery store the other day and I looked at it and it, it was kind of expensive and it was kind of freezer burnt. Maybe it was just because nobody eats, nobody's a vegetarian where I live. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm confusing the issue with facts. I would be a little nervous in this one just because it's had such an incredible run, but I hear you and it's begun, it has begun to pull back a little bit. So maybe it's trying to make another run. This is would be a fly. This would be a die and fly. Sometimes they'll do that, okay, with the IPO. Sometimes they'll fly, I mean, they'll take off and then they'll die out and then they'll begin to fly again. So I think it looks okay. I think you could certainly do better. Flavored dog food, is that what it tastes like? Like, how do they make, is it beets? Is it ground up beets? Those suck. Meat is kind of a joke. Fake meat is kind of a joke. Okay. <laughs> you guys tell me what you really think. <laughs> CGC, is that right? I thought it was canopy growth. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually starting to get a little bullish on some of these weed stocks. I am long SNDL, which I'll pull up next. Um, it's beginning to improve a little bit. You could see that it's bottomed out. It's kind of what a head and shoulders type of bottom. Now I don't directly trade off of classical technical analysis, but I do pay attention to it. So yeah, this might be interesting on a little bit of a pullback in here. Let's take a look at the, it doesn't have a whole lot of bad memories. So it's, it's sort of interesting. Definitely has bottomed out. Let's just continue to keep an eye on that. I am long S and DL which I talked about earlier, was doing fantastic this morning, and now it's coming back in a little bit. And if you zoom in a little bit, it looks a little bit better than it does fully zoomed out. But you can see that it's bottomed out, and it's kind of pulled back in here. And now it's trying, today notwithstanding, or late morning notwithstanding, it's trying to rally out of that what looks like a major bottom. Postmortem is keeping a journal. Yeah, it's, but not just a journal on hey, I got in this at this, more like, okay, I'm thinking about doing this, or this is outside my plan, or, oh, man, I can't believe I just lost all this effing money, or, boy, I just made an S ton of money, you know, just all these different things. Get those emotions in there, and then, again, I can't emphasize this a month, and, and just try it for three months, and if you hate it, just tell me you hate it and bitch me out for wasting your time, but for three months, get up and write every morning three pages. And it's going to help your life. It's going to help your trading. It's just great. Okay, Donald remembers. <laughs> I did not have sex with that woman on sexual relations. Miss Lewinsky. <laughs> Google uh, Dave Chappelle on that. It's funny. All right, Chris, one of the Chris's, CJ, says INSW. See, CJ is really CA, so that's going to be confusing for me. Um, this would pull back a little too far. I was watching these shippers, but you can see it broke out of the base here, but now it's pulled back a little bit too far. So I would pass on that one. T and K, which were long, has been pulling back lately, I think would be a better play if you felt like you had to go off the shipper. If somebody's watching, they're looking to go buy a shipper. INSW, yeah. OCFT, OCFT I like. I just got stopped out of that one. I think a lot of you guys in the Facebook group played it. It's gotten a little volatile though. Um, you know, maybe treat it like a TKO, enter here and then stop here. So, I mean, that's a pretty, that's like four points. That's quite a bit now. It's gotten a little too crazy, maybe even by my standards, but 
I might reevaluate the situation, never say never. But yeah, if you did play it above the high, below the low of this big wide range bar down, might be a good spot for that. Good eye, Donald. I don't know if you're in the, are you in the um, Facebook group? If not, why not? <laughs> yeah, this is when it caught my eye. This was on a Landry list a few days ago. And unfortunately, it had this big old gap open. I was going to watch it and see what happens. And so it really didn't let you in before it began to took off, take off. But yeah, it looks pretty good, but it's not set up now. You have to wait for the next setup on that one. Saba. I don't know why I know this stock. Oh, yeah, because it's it's been coming up in the scans. It's just too crazy. I mean, it's wow. You know, and this is one that didn't really let us in, didn't give us a clean setup, I don't think. You know, this is part of the, I guess you could argue that it was set up way back here. I don't know if I had it on my list or not. But it was just such a wild and crazy stock. It went up, went from like, uh, went up 250% or whatever, 300% over a short period of time. And I technically, yeah, I did make a first thrust, probably made a bow tie and a few other things before it took off. But now your HV is up around 200. So it's just really, 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 really crazy. Don't bet the form if you go after it. I hear you. I'd almost like to see a much deeper pullback, more of a TKO type of move if I'm going to take something like that. CZZ, CZZ, that's going to be Cousins. You took an IPO trade. All right, let's take a look at that. A TKO trade. Okay, I got you. One thing, this is hard for me to explain. I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions on this. It's like it might be priced for perfection because they're not splitting the atom and they're up at such high levels and been in such a long, long trend. My only concern is when you've got a stock like this, even though it fits all the criteria, is that it could be priced for perfection. So if they have a little earnings mishap or something, they could get torpedoed really fast, especially since the HV, I'm sorry, the volume is so high. The HV is a little low. I think that's what I might've been getting to too. In a case like this, I mean, hindsight's 2020, but maybe a little bit higher entry when you have these TKO type of moves. It's not bad. Stick with your position. Don't let me talk you out of it because maybe it'll go on a double from here. Okay. And you definitely are following the rules. You've got a double top knockout. You've got persistency. You've got some acceleration. So it's a really good looking stock. Again, my big concern is just long, long, long term. It's just way up here at nosebleed. So AR. Y A I R I. We got time for one more. A I R I. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. A little bit on the thin side, given the volume. Okay, and then a little bit, a little bit crazy. Not completely crazy, but it did have a pretty good run over a short period of time. HV around 90. Yeah, this is super speculative. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. Believe it or not. And I think it might be worth a shot, but only for a very, very, very aggressive type of, of trade. I would almost say avoid it just based on the volume and price because it's not that thick of a stock. But it's it does look good. I, I hear you on that. But the problem is it's gone so far so fast. It's going to be a dangerous ride. And again, wait for a little bit more pullback. OK. All right. You're welcome, Chris and others. All right, I think we're out of time. I appreciate everybody showing up today. Thank you so much. Any un unanswered questions? Unanswered questions? I sound like my dear. Uh, unanswered questions. Hallelujah. David, DaveLander.com. Ideally, submit them through the system in the members area, and that way they'll become part of a bigger presentation so everybody can benefit. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And stay posted on the website, and I'll announce whether or not we'll do another show. Uh, this week or skip, I'm sorry, next week or whether we'll skip it. Again, everybody have a great weekend. We will talk again soon. Thank you so much.